No, oh, okay. Langley. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, that's a new year, so I was scared. Yeah. You don't need this. No, but we need that. Great, thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Hard act to follow after that great lunch. It's like, okay, everybody, let's go have some siesta. But I don't know, in this weather, we're out lake, I think, you know, but I, Wes might get a little upset with us if we just all take off, huh? <laughs> I hear Wes can get really upset. Is that what some of the workers were telling me not so long ago? <laughs> They're all going to be very diplomatically quiet at this stage. Um, I'm going to just give a little bit of rundown on what we do at the Citizens Research Institute and some of the work that we've done here in British Columbia. A lot of the work that we've done here in BC will probably pull together many of, uh, of bits of the information that you've had from the speakers here over this weekend. It's been quite educational to sit and hear what's happening uh, across the line as well as throughout this country and all the good work that people are doing. And I think that's the most encouraging news is that there is so much good work being carried out by so many good people. People willing to stand up and expose the truth. And of course that always creates some kind of great fun. And I'm not sure why that is, but uh, we'll give a, a few examples of some of the riots that have happened when I've been speaking. Um, well, much talk hasn't been on about the International Socialist, but I'll be touching on that. And you'll have to excuse my accent. With all these Americans, my American upbringing just comes out, and I have dual citizenship, so they've got to keep me on both sides of the line. But hearing them is like being home again. So if I start sounding really American, it's not because I'm down there too often. I get down as much as I can. But it's something, it's like when I talk to your brother who's down in California, it takes a week to get rid of the accent again. You know, maybe it's some subconscious thing you wish you were still down there surfing or on the beach or something rather than up here trying to save this nation from the fascist government that we have. But anyway, we'll talk a little bit about that. As a matter of fact, it was on a, an occasion not so long ago, I was speaking across the line at an international conference. And uh, what it was was the Western influence into third world countries. And the ambassador's uh, wife to Japan was in the audience and we were talking about all the things that were going on in Canada. And she came up to me afterwards, she said, Carrie, I didn't realize Canada was a communist country. And I said, well, that's the problem. Most Canadians don't realize it either. <laughs> when people hear what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis, just in this province, how many people are from British Columbia? Okay, we got lots of British Columbians here. And when you find out what's really happening here in just this province alone, forget the nation, we'll touch on that too. But you'll go, my goodness, where have we been and what have we been doing? Now, you guys are the informed lot, so I'm going to look for a lot of good response. But most people go away and say, Carrie, I didn't have an idea. And I asked them when the last time was that they read a newspaper. They can't remember. Well, not that I have very much confidence in the media. You know, I, I tend to sue the media lots these days. Uh, I, I like to use this approach to life that actually I was sitting there being able to relate to it quite quite a lot, except that we've taken it beyond the courts. Now we're dealing with the human rights commissions, which I think is a very important area that I want to talk a lot about today, because I do believe that that is going to be the stronghold that will try, truly try to curtail freedom within this province and in this nation. So just a little bit about the work on behalf of citizens. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. And we refuse to receive any kind of government funding whatsoever. They don't know what to do with us because they can't control us. Media rather likes us, at least some of the media. Uh, Rafe Mir and I used to be very good friends uh, up until a few uh, years ago when we got on opposite ends of an of a issue and uh, our side was winning. He didn't like that. So he's dedicated a number of editorials to my person, which was fine. It was, that was a good sport for a little while. Then he went overboard, so we're suing him. And uh, that's moving along quite nicely. We go into discoveries in uh, October. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the media, a little bit more later, because the media is very important. I think quite often when people get on issues, and I see this lots of times on issues involving where everybody thinks that this politically correct left-leaning media is leading everybody by the nose. And I would agree, but there's a reason for that. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, our side of things have never stood up and pulled back on the other side of the rope. For one thing, we're too busy being quiet, writing nasty letters that are full of emotion rather than logic quite often, 
And then there's other reasons, of course, about who wants the information, what kind of information is out there. But we have also been negligent in making sure that our voice is heard on those fronts. Uh, one of the speakers, I can't recall who it was, but uh, I think it was Mark last night, said, you know, the media likes ratings, right? It's about money. And I'll tell you, that's what it's about, people. CBC pays me to do their debates. Go figure that one. I'll tell you why. Because their ratings go through the roof, because the majority of Canadians are fed up with big government, government coming into all areas of our lives. What we need is not separation of church and state. We need separation of state and citizenry, and they need to get out of our business and back to serving us. And there are a couple ways to do that, but we'll, we'll get into that. Citizens Research Institute is a vehicle for the people. Um, one of our genesis uh, uh, ideas or issues, I guess, came about with the Charlatan Accord. And what happened with that was we got very fed up, a number of us, with what we saw as big government just spinning out the wheels of propaganda, everybody not wanting to go down that route, but having no access to information to equip themselves. I disagree with the statement, information is power. Information is merely a tool, and it's what you do with that tool that determines how much power you have. Think about that. It's, it's too easy to pay lip service to, I'm armed with information. Well, so what? You have a whole bunch of information here. What are you going to go do with it? Information is only power if you use it for some purpose, and you know how to use it. We can all take a hammer. Some of us can build some things, some of us can destroy some things, but the quality of what we build, if building is what we're going to do, is dependent on our ability to use that hammer and a knowledge base on other things. It all works together. The Charlatan Accord, what we had was, we decided that we didn't like everybody that was being duped. We thought people should have that information, at least then they could make an informed choice. The mandate of the Citizens Research Institute is to ensure that people have an ability to be equipped with information so that they are in a position to make an informed decision if they want to. Now that's the biggest challenge here in Canada, getting people actually to do something. Uh, people like to hear it and they like to come out and hear Carrie and all the good speakers speak, but it's what you do afterwards. Canadians, by and large, I don't know, give me the states any time. You know, you go down there, you can create a lot of hell down there. You know, just get them going, and, it's, and we know how to go. And I'm very thankful for the American education that I received because it was still at a point when they said, if you believe in something, you stand up and you fight for it. And yes, there is a cost. That was a given. Here in Canada, if you stand up and fight and someone says something nasty about you, y'all run in the other direction. I don't get that. You know, we need to stand up and be counted. And, you know, maybe it's a middle child thing, but uh, names never really bothered me. Matter of fact, I like names now because there's dollar signs attached when I sue people. So <laughs> it, it's getting kind of good. I never got that kind of profit from my brothers and sisters. <laughs> Tell you, no justice in my house growing up, that's for sure. Uh, we just had a situation where uh, uh, the National Post, as a matter of fact, I don't even have to sue people anymore. I just get, and I do, I think there are some good lawyers of which I have access to. Usually they just write a letter and they say, how much will make her happy now? It's getting really good. I have to drop writs or anything. So things are changing as long as people stand up, are equipped, make sure they don't have the goods on you. I mean, that's an important part. You know, if they're making up um, stories, as the media tends to do, because of the lack of professionalism within journalism, um, you know, do something about it. We need to hold them into account. Anyway, with the Charlatan Accord, uh, we had calls from across this nation. People were rising. We had pockets of people starting up the no groups. I don't know if any of you remember going back to the 80s on this. And we had calls from everywhere. So we, as the Citizens Research Institute, believe in equipping people, so we created the Charlatan's Web, which was an information brochure that could be distributed. We left it generic, so the little no groups springing up all over the place could put their stamp on it, raise money, because war is never cheap. I don't care what war you're fighting, it always costs money. We have to equip the people with the ability to go out and get that information out. And it was a marvelous time. It was a six-week marathon from dawn to dusk and then phones never stop people from across this nation phoning saying we need the information 
one of the, the fun parts of this was the guy who was heading up the YES Committee, and there was quite a bit of scandal at the time about uh, how much money the YES Committee was getting from the federal government, because of course the federal government was paying for all of this you know, pro-government propaganda to be out there. Finally, I got a call from the YES Committee, and they said, Carrie, we're getting all kinds of calls from people who want both sides of the information, and we're prohibited from giving the no side. Now imagine the government, which would, you know, I mean, in a, in a you know, utopian existence would want all you people informed, was refusing to give out information. So he says, can we, can we send everybody who wants all of the facts over to you? <laughs> I said, that depends. How big's your budget? <laughs> he said, well, they didn't give us any money to, for the no side. I said, well, that's fine. Send them on over to us anyway. Anyway, make a long story short, we, we do recall the resounding defeat of that referendum. People were informed, perhaps not to the degree that we would all like them to be. I remember the majority of calls were, Carrie, I'm going to vote no, I just want one reason to vote no. That's, that's Canadian involvement if I ever heard it. You know, just give me one reason so I can sleep tonight. Well, people, you know what, if that's what it takes, that's what we're dealing with. But that tells me two things. Number one, if we can get people's interest, it doesn't take a whole bunch of time to educate them because they don't need a whole bunch of education, they just want to agree with you. But to get people mobilized into doing something, and there are a lot of things that can be done. So the Citizens Research Institute operates in a variety of forms. We've got working committees on legal, medical, health issues. We have an advocacy division that we kind of fell into when we did a research project into the amount of children that were being apprehended. And I suppose our, our interest in that came from what was happening within public education, or public indoctrination, as I call it. It is not about education. It is about, uh, well, we've heard the ability to prepare people for suggestive thinking, to take away the skills of critical thinking, and all of that is very much happening within our public education system. Uh, the year 2000, the focus on visualization and guided imagery, again, preparing the ground for children to become very sensitive to suggestion and the ability for certain things to be trigger zones in, in what they're doing. That concerned us. We were able to get rid of the year 2000. There was enough problems, other areas with it. But we brought in a whole other curriculum called the career and personal planning, which again goes into areas that the state has no business. And this is about the relationship between the state and her citizens. We need to say that there is a, a line of division. I was speaking up in um, Prince George. I don't know if, uh, remember the recall effort that happened up in Prince George, the first one, that initial uh, case against Ramsey? We were the ones that uh, initiated that event. We had over 650 people in the Civic Center there. And uh, the issue I was up there speaking on were parental rights within public education. And I think this is key and cornerstone, as is the legislation that allows the state to come in and take our children. The areas of freedom and liberty, which is why we're all gathered here about truth, about what's right, about what's standing to be true, and what kind of nation. We're talking about the identity of Canada. And there are agents of change that want to see that identity change drastically, and they're, they're, they're achieving it. It's working very well. Everything from the politically correct nonsense, which is anything but equality, it is discriminatory in its very nature, to the breakdown of the family, create a society where there is confusion and inconsistency and what do you have an ability as the state to do whatever you want because everybody's in this chaos and pandemonium. Nobody's watching what they're doing. They're quite happy with all of us struggling to pay taxes, <laughs> for those of us who do. <laughs> I understand there's a few who don't in this room. <laughs> I have a very creative accountant, and uh, he probably loved to have uh, some chats with all those ones that are not. But we have this, this diversionary tactic taking place where we, the common sense thinking people who are paying the taxes, who are wanting for this nation, for all that Canada is and should be recognized for, we don't have time to protect that because we're too busy making sure our kids aren't part of gangs, that they're getting educated, that they're not rebelling against home rules. And yet, within the public education itself, we have this feed coming in that's just feeding in the opposite direction. It's not one about unity, it's about division. 
In Prince George, it, it dawned on me when I was speaking up there, and the issues that it brought me up there were finally enough parents were fed up when this homosexual curriculum came into the public education system that they said no. Now, that's been a very interesting issue. The teachers came to us and said, Carrie, we need your help on something. And I said, well, what? She says, well, they want us to promote homosexuality within the public education system. And I kind of laughed, and I said, well, so what else is new? You know, I mean, this goes back years, because our system has been more involved in social engineering than in the academic performance of our future generations for a long time. I mean, anyone that thinks there's education happening there needs to visit the classroom and see what's truly going on. Anyway, she said, no, 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 this is different. The union is putting forward a mandate that we promote this within education as a normal and acceptable form of, of sexual activity. Of course, it comes right down from the people that want to reduce population and all the other theories that go along with, with making the abnormal normal. So I said, well, let me see the information. So we did a little bit of research ourselves, and we found out that the NDP government, unbeknownst to anybody, had passed a special resolution, and that was to promote through curricular changes issues around homosexuality, bisexuality, and transgendered issues, okay? So we were doing quite a bit of public awareness on this because I believe that parents have the right to instill a moral and value system in their children, have that respected in the public education system, and it is not the right of the state to usurp that which you want your children to have. Um, that to me is one of the cornerstone issues that we're dealing with. Somebody said, Carrie, what, do you, what would you need to change Canada for the better? I said, give me public education for 15 years. That's all I'd want. Because the minds of the young, they're impressionable, you can, you can teach them, you can show them which way to go. What better access to the identity of this nation than to access the public education system, the masses of young, impressionable minds? Think about it. We all need to be aware because this is where a lot of all these issues that we're talking about are being rooted right now. Anyway, I went up to Prince George and Tim Stevenson, the gay MLA, they were having their little rally outside. They bust the rent -a mob from Vancouver up there and a few other things. But it dawned on me while we were speaking to this packed house in, in Prince George that, you know, we, and not being raised in a particularly religious home, quite the opposite, li liberal Southern California, it dawned on me that uh, here we have the pastors of the area coming together to say, no, look, we need to deal with some issues here about truth, about values, about society morals. We need to look at the cost of what's happening to the devaluing of family, the breakdown of family. Children are being harmed because everybody can just go and do what they want to do and there's no accountability, no responsibility. So it dawned on me while I was speaking to, to these people, I said, you know, isn't it interesting? We hear about the separation of church and state all the time, yet the church, it seems to me, has stayed in their little church gatherings and they're so busy with their Bible studies and all the rest of it that they rarely come out. Yet the state has expanded into the areas that the church used to be, right? They've taken over education, they've taken over our hospitals, they've taken over social services, and now they want to take over our kids. So you tell me who should get back in their box. And then they want to charge us 50%, the church only wants 10%, so they're the better deal anyway. But <laughs> the pastors all go, you know what, we never thought about it that way. Well, no, because we don't think, do we? We're, we're conditioned not to question. There, there is a proverb that I love. It says, he who presents his case first seems right till another voice questions. If the voice of second questioning doesn't happen, then nobody's putting that statement to the test. If anything I say up here today can't stand the test of second questioning people, it doesn't deserve to stand at all. We have been conditioned not to think. We look at the public education system. Parents, what do we do? And we're as guilty as anybody. We send our kids and tell them what? Listen to the teacher. Do we ever question ourselves what that teacher's being indoctrinated with? What kind of information's coming into the classroom? And you know what? They get the kids more than the parents do. Look at the daycare. Look at the preschool. 
Ted Gunnerson said in response to somebody about, you know, how to protect your kids. Well, people, I am completely opposed to daycare, completely opposed to anything that takes away my ability to make sure the information that's being given to my children is consistent with what I as a parent. The state does not have the right to usurp my authority, my beliefs, my standards in the public education system. We even have some Supreme Court law on those kinds of issues that I think is worth, worth reading. Talking about parents, and this is an apprehension case where the state was asked to override the, the rights of a parent. This is what the Supreme Court of Canada said, talking about the role of being a parent. This role translates into a protective sphere of parental decision making which is rooted in the presumption that parents should make most decisions that affect their children. Most likely because they are going to appreciate the best interest of the children and I love this judge. See there are a few good judges. He says because most importantly they're going to make the decision that are in the best interest of their children but also because the state is ill-equipped to make such decisions. When have we ever seen the state make good decisions about kids? Not very often. We got into the area of apprehension because we had so many people calling us. And I'll be the first to confess that originally I thought, oh, well, there's smoke, there must be fire. You know, who would go in? I mean, that is about as blatant of, of act of evil that you can imagine somebody taking somebody's child without good reason. Well. That was going back about 12 years ago. We kept getting these cases, more of these cases. Then we were dealing with a program, again within the public education system, called the CARE program. Sounds so nice, doesn't it? Child Abuse Research and Education. You may even have it in your school system here in Salmon Arm or wherever you're from. Check it out. CARE program. Who's going to argue with the CARE program? It must be okay because the school's got it, so it must have passed all these tests. Psychologists must have endorsed it, right? Wrong. The program was causing more destruction in families. As a matter of fact, I called it a, a radical feminist dream come true because little children, five, six, seven, eight years of age, were being told the people most likely to harm them were their fathers and their grandfathers. Now, in many circumstances, that unfortunately is true. But in the overall majority of children within the public education system, with this crazy world that we have, my goodness, let's at least let the children feel safe at home. But this program was instilling fear into these children about the people that they should love and depend on. And of course, now look at the psychology of this program, people. Thinking about all the workshops and, and uh, the messages that you've heard here. Okay, children, if they are uprooted or disjointed or disassociated from their family, become very vulnerable to suggestion, don't they? Because our humanness requires us to bond and have to trust somebody. That's, what, that's why when we're children, we're vulnerable. This program go, went beyond telling children that the people most likely to harm them were their fathers and their grandfathers and all the important male role models in their, in their lives. This program told them that the people you could trust are who? The teachers, the policemen, everybody but a parent. Okay, so this process of causing this distrust and mistrust within our children starts from a very early age. This program is very beneficial to all the suggestions that we've heard through this, this uh, conference on how children's minds can be taken and through the power of suggestion, or in this case, through blatant curriculum. And you know what the scary part is? Is parents were battling to have this program in their schools. Why? Because they thought that if little five-year-old Susie learned to put her hands on her hips and say no, that somehow that would protect her from being abused. Now think about the lack of logic. And this is important because when we're talking about how people fall into this, how people get hooked into believing that the government is their friend and all the rest of it, it starts here. These kids wouldn't even remember these kinds of programs unless they get them when they're eight or nine. They'd still do in some, some districts. But think about this. 
If getting children to say no stopped abuse, then women wouldn't be raped, your car wouldn't be carjacked, and all the other things. No has never been the problem. It's usually getting the offender or the abuser to respect the no that we have the problem. So even if we were to look for what was good in this program, there isn't much, if any. The program taught children to stand there with their hands on their hips and look the abuser in the eye. This is the, the, the information that's given to kids through a puppet and just say no. Well, thank you kindly. If, if somebody's going to be trying to do that to my kids, I want them to scream from the rooftops, run their cute little legs out the door as fast as they can and come and get me. And I assure you, I know how to deal with people like that. Far better than my five or six or seven year old. For the children who are in those circumstances, because that's always the argument that comes back, and people, it's always important to keep balance in these kinds of, of matters because they're emotional. I heard some statistics through one of the, the uh, presentations that concerned me a little bit. You know, four out of five women will be sexually abused. Okay? We need to question, well, what, how is that defined then? Because if it's based on Badgley, which is the largest report here in Canada, the question that was asked to women was, has anyone ever touched you in a sexual way when you didn't want them to? Quite honestly, it should be about 100%, because I think there's many wives sitting here tonight that can probably think of one or two occasions when she didn't really want to be bothered. Yet, if you were to answer that question appropriately and honestly, as they required the participants to do, you can see how we can get whatever statistics we want to put out the result that we think we need in order to sell the product. This program for the children that are in this situation, and I probably can't say it better than a mother whose three-year-old daughter was sexually assaulted on a continuous and horrific basis by her father. She said, Carrie, my daughter doesn't need to sit through her kindergarten class and be told all she had to do was say no. She did say no. So does that mean she's going to have double the guilt because she didn't say no in the appropriate way? I don't think so. No, teachers do play an important role in these areas, and we deal with a lot of families who do have problems. Um, the school can train teachers to look for the signs, but there has to be a filtering process because right now we have kids being taken right, left, and center for every ridiculous accusation that comes out of the interpretation of a teacher. We had one um, case where a little girl deliberately tore her coat and didn't want to go home. Well, I guess so, smart kid, eh? And the do-gooder teacher said, why don't you want to go home, Marcy? Oh, I'm going to get in trouble because I ripped my coat. The teacher thought that this child must be from a home that was so full of violence that this child was too much in fear of her family to, to even go home, so she called in the authorities. The authorities came, it was just before Christmas, and... Uh, took the children out of the classroom. The principal came, and this can happen in, in your children's school. The state has the right to come without your notice as parents, take your children out of the classroom. Now, when we talk about liberty, truth, level playing fields, to me, this law, which I'll go into depth on, probably illustrates how far we have, how we have lost it as Canadians with our ability to tell the government Absolutely no. That is in territory that you have no business going in. Anyway, principal comes into their classroom, tells the two girls, <coughs> there's two girls, and uh, he goes to clear, we got a very special guest for you. Somebody's here to see you, a visitor. Of course, the girls, it's two days before Christmas. I mean, you know, things are happening in their minds. Santa's here, you know, I'm sure, you know, just big events. So skippity-loo down to the office they go. They open the door. And here is this social worker, and the little girl described the social worker later as, Mommy, you know that story you tell us about a wolf in sheep's clothing? <laughs> Smart little girl. Those girls were placed in this room with this stranger, which is usually contrary to all of our training as parents, and interrogated for over an hour and a half. Finally, under heavy questioning, it came to light that the children were sometimes afraid of their parents. Okay, now this is an hour and a half. And why is that? Well, because if we do something bad, we get spanked. Well, of course, we all know in this 
nation now, how we discipline our children has somehow come up for review under the, the um, government's idea. Now, I'm going to come back to that because that's an, another important issue. And again, the relationship between the state and the citizenry. And if we want our rights, if we want government to stay within their box. See, I think government has a perfectly legitimate role within our lives and within society. But that is a defined role, very small, go and build roads kind of thing. Yeah, you can clap. <laughs> Government has become big business, and it has no place other to expand to than taking away our guns and hiring a bunch of bureaucrats to, to register us by asking all kinds of invasive questions. And if they don't like our answers, coming into our houses, having a law that allows them to use our computers and our fax machines to you know, facilitate the transformation of information to their bureaucratic headquarters to arrest us. You know, what are we